My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. I'm a type A personality. Do you know what that is? Yeah, and he is a type B personality. And if your last name is Spencer, it is type capital B. And if your name is Covey, it's type capital A. My little grandson, Hudson. You need to pray for Hudson. Do you know what a type A and a type B personality, you know what I'm talking about, is a type B personality. I wished I was more of a type B personality because a type B personality is like, you know, there, you know, come, where's the party? You know, let's just enjoy life and let's just chill out. And, and I wished I was that way. The type A personality is what? Come on, come on, come on, come on. We don't have time to be at fun, you know. Get on with it. And, and my little grandson, Hudson, uh, bless his heart. Of course, uh, he, he's getting it honest. Both of his parents are type A personalities. But little Hudson, you know, even if, you, if you're lining up things in colors, whatever they, they are, uh, you know, you know the, the cartoon, the, the movie there, the, the Incredibles? You remember that, you know? And that guy that had to line the pencils up, you remember I like it? You know, I go into a waiting room at a doctor's office, and I, while I'm waiting, I line up all the symmetrically, the magazines and all like that. And so Hudson's got to have his colors matching and, and everything like that. It, it's, we need both in life, don't we? You know, my philosophy is the reason... Some can be type B personality is because they know type A personality is going to get it ready for them to be, you know, that. But anyhow, because I'm a type A personality, sometimes I am so far ahead of myself, and even worse, I'm so far ahead of God. That, that I am planning and I am thinking and I am like that. And sometimes I am, am, I do not have time to pray. That's just the honest truth. I always have time to pray. You know, every once in a while, I just don't take time to pray. That's what I mean. You know, and every once in a while, God has got to, to do something in my life to cause me. And isn't it amazing that when a hardship, a difficulty, hell, finances, whatever it is, isn't it amazing that when a difficult situation comes into our life, suddenly we have time to pray? Matter of fact, we may have time to get down on our face and pray. God has a way of slowing us down sometimes. This morning, I want us to study about a man that I believe was a type A personality in many ways, and that's good because God used him in a magnificent way, yet it kind of, I think it kind of caused him to get ahead of God, and to, to put it in a nutshell, he crashed. Type A personalities sometimes can crash if they get too far ahead of God. So let's look at it, 1 Kings chapter 18. The story's about a guy by the name of Elijah. And some say Elijah's the Iron Man of the Old Testament. And in verse 30, let's pick up, you know, a few years ago I did a series on Elijah, but just here now, this, this is the high point of his ministry. Verse 30 of 1 Kings 18, Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the, Lord, the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar as great as would contain two measure of seeds or several gallons. And he put the wood for the sacrifice in order, and he cut the bull in pieces, and he laid them on the wood, and he said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, let's stop here for a second. If you were going to start a fire, would you pour water on it? But he says, pour four barrels of water on the sacrifice and on the wood. Verse 34, he said, do it the second time. 
Then he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the verse 35 says, the water ran round about the altar, and it filled the trench also with water. So the, 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 it's completely flooded, and there's water in the trench that he dug around the stone altar. Verse 36 came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and he said, he's praying. Here's his prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Let me stop there for a second. How many of us would have the courage to get up in front of the church this morning and say, I am going to prove to you there is a God. And I'm going to pray an impossible prayer prove to you that there's a God. Probably most of us wouldn't do that. Maybe we don't have that much faith, but he did. He's standing in front of 450 false prophets of Baal. They've tried to offer their offering, no fire fell. Of course, Baal's not a real God. Elijah is praying, and he not only, he, he's not going to set the wood on fire. He's going to ask God to send fire from heaven. And like to say, and not only that, he has drenched the sacrifice with water. It's impossible for this to happen. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell, and it consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Glory to God, Glory to God. unreal. Verse 39. The Bible says, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, I bet. And they said, the Lord, Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. Elijah was a, was a mighty man of God. His name means Yahweh, Jehovah, is, is my God. And he lived up to his name. He performed a number of miracles. The book of James tells us that he prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. And the reason he did that was because that was a part of God's judgment. God was going to prove to the nation of Israel that all these false gods were not really gods, but there's only one God. His name's Jehovah. So he told Elijah, let it be known publicly that you're going to pray. Go to King Ahab and tell him you're going to pray that it won't rain for three and a half years. And you want to know what? It did not rain. A drop for three and a half years. And then God said, now go and pray that it will rain. And he went and prayed and it did rain. He uh, stayed for a time period during those three and a half years. He stayed with a widow in another part of the land there and her son. And the widow, he asked the widow to prepare him a meal. And the widow said, you know, I would love to prepare you a meal, but I've just barely got enough flour for myself and my son. And tell you the truth, I had planned on just preparing one more meal, and that's it. And we don't have anything else, and I guess we'll just eat that meal and die. And Elijah said, tell you what, prepare that meal. And I guarantee you there will always be enough flour there and for you. And she did. She took a step of faith. She prepared that meal for Elijah. And she used what olive oil she had left there. She prepared the meal. And then the next day she went to the meal barrel. And guess what? There was enough meal there for the next day. And for the next day. And for the next day. For the next day. But Elijah performed even a greater miracle than that. The widow's son died. And so Elijah went up to the, to the room where the little the boy, I don't know how old he was, he was there, and the Bible says that he was stretched out on the bed, and Elijah laid down face to face his body directly on the, over the boy, and he prayed, and God raised the boy back to life. That's a miracle. That's a miracle to raise the dead back to life. And then when Elijah went home, he had a, he, when he went to heaven, he had a, you know, I've done a lot of funerals, but I've never experienced this in a funeral. The Bible says when it was time for Elijah to go home, God took him to heaven in a chariot of fire. So this, so this is a mighty man of God. This is a man that when he prays, heaven listens, heaven move. If you had a prayer request, this is the guy that you'd go to and say, pray for me. And Elijah, one of his greatest miracles is when he calls down this fire from heaven. Now look at chapter 19. 
It's on the same day. You would think that a man that could call down fire from heaven, nothing would scare him. But it says in verse 1 of 1 Kings 19, Ahab, who is the king, told Jezebel, who is his wicked wife, all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets of Baal with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, she put a contract out on his life. You killed my prophets, you will be killed, you will be dead by this time tomorrow. Now, a man that could call down fire from heaven, Let's just say that you don't have the rest of the Bible. You don't know what happened. A man that could call down fire from heaven and some, some woman would make this threat against him, what would you suppose that Elijah would say? Come on. You know? Do it if you think you can do it. Come on. But notice what it says in verse 3. When he saw it, and probably a better translation is when he heard that. He arose and he went for his life. He ran. This great man of God who calls down fire from heaven is running like a scared rabbit. He ran and he came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah. The nation of Israel at this time is divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Elijah's a prophet in the northern kingdom. He runs all the way out of the northern kingdom. He goes all the way out of you know, Virginia through North Carolina into South Carolina. He runs all the way into the kingdom of Judah to hide from her. And he left his his servant there. But then verse 4 says, but he himself went even another day journey into the wilderness. And he came and he sat under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. And he said, I give up. That's what he says. God, I give up. It's enough. Lord, just take my life. Take me on home. I've done my very best and it didn't work. And I quit and just Take my life. I'm not going to ask you if you ever prayed that prayer, but I bet you there's some in this room. Sometime you've said, just take me home, God. I'm tired of trying to fight this. It's not working. I quit. And that's what Elijah's doing. This man that calls down fire from heaven says, I quit. Why? Verse 5. As he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. I'll tell you one thing. One problem Elijah had was that he was wore out. He was physically exhausted. Many years ago, a man told me, he quoted Vince Lombardi, said to his football team one time, that fatigue will make cowards of us all. So if you, if you and I do not take care of ourselves physically, God created a day of rest. Matter of fact, the nation of Israel had to religiously, if you will, to perform that, the day of rest. And not only that, they had days of rest. They had years of rest. And every 50th year of the year of Jubilee, they had a complete, you know, total nothing. They couldn't even plan anything. So God made us. We need rest along the way. So God lets him sleep. He's wore out. God feeds him a meal with an angel. Verse 6, he looked, behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink, but then he laid down again. He's, he's wore out. He's physically exhausted. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and went in the strength of that meat. Notice what it says in verse 8. Forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, unto the mount of God. Now, I want, in case you haven't picked up what's happening here. Jezebel threatens him. He takes off. He, first of all, he runs completely out of the northern kingdom into the southern kingdom to hide at a place like Beersheba. And that's still not enough. So he leaves his servant there and he goes another day's journey into the wilderness. And that's not enough. He goes another 40 days into the wilderness. Have you ever been in the wilderness? Not physically speaking, but spiritually speaking. Have you ever been in the wilderness, spiritually speaking? I have been in the wilderness before, spiritually speaking. Disillusion, depressed, discouraged, whatever word you want to use there. I have been there before. 
And I'm sure that most of us have been there at some point or time. And, I, and here's the contrast of this story is that he's, on, he's, he's one moment, he's on a mountain calling down fire from heaven in the face of nearly 500 false prophets. And the next day he's just running. And, and some commentaries say that he, he ran almost 200 miles. It's, a, it's about 90 miles from here to Bristol, I think. Maybe a little over that from here. Let's say it's 100 miles. That's a long, past Bristol. He's going into the wilderness as far as he can go. He goes to Mount Sinai. I think he's totally discouraged, spiritually speaking. And so he's probably going to what he feels is the most sacred place on the face of the earth. And he goes all the way down to Mount Sinai there to try to figure it all out. I believe that, that Elijah had two problems. I think there's two things that caused his crash. Number one, I've already mentioned, I think that he was physically exhausted. But secondly, I believe that he was spiritually running on empty. Can that happen? Can a, can a Christian run on empty? Can a man of God or a woman of God run on empty? Yes, it can happen. Many, many years ago, uh, when I was in school, I had a teacher, and he assigned us a book to read, and it really wasn't even a part of the class curriculum, but he just wanted us to read this book, and I'm glad that he did. It's Gordon McDonald wrote this book, and, and the title of the book is Ordering Your Private World. And the book is about this. What Gordon MacDonald is teaching in this book is that there are two parts of us. There's an outer external part of us that people see. And, and sometimes we can put on such a facade and we can, we can do things. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm great. You know, and we can, we can tell people and we can go through all these things externally. But Gordon MacDonald says that is only the outside. That is only the, the shell. The real you is who you are on the inside. The inner world. The inner you. Paul refers to that in the book of Ephesians. To be strengthened with God's might in the inner man, the soul, the spirit, the real part of you. One book that I was reading this week said this. And you and I are no stronger than who we are in the inner man. What really determines who we are is not who we are on the external and all the motions we're going through. And we can be like Elijah. We can just be trying to somehow dig a little bit deeper and get a little more energy and get that one more thing done. And just we can, we can do that. We can just kind of push ourselves maybe to the point of, of a physical collapse. That's what happened to Elijah, a physical collapse. We can sometimes muster up the strength to just kind of keep it going on the external. But what really determines who we are is what's going on on the internal. Gordon MacDonald calls it a garden, a garden of the soul that we must cultivate and take care of and keep the weeds pulled out and make sure that it is strong and healthy. And here's what I believe that was happening with Elijah. I believe Elijah was, was, was on the outside. People would have looked at Elijah on the outside at this point in time and you're thinking, wow, what a man of God. This is the iron man of the Bible. This is the guy that, you know, the Bible equates him to John the Baptist. Now, I don't know what Elijah wore, but actually the Bible calls John the Baptist Elijah. And you know John the Baptist, you know, it's, it's camel's hair and eating locusts and living out in the open. I mean, he is a rugged man, right? John the Baptist is. And the Bible equates John the Baptist and Elijah. So I kind of imagine... We don't, we, the only thing we really know about Elijah was, was that he was, what he was, was that Elijah or Elisha that was bald-headed? And I think it's Elisha, actually, that called the, the bear out and ate the kids. That, that's a whole other story. But anyhow, he's a rugged man. And externally, everybody would have thought, wow, you know, he's got it all together. But what they did not know was, was that internally, he was very weak. Matter of fact, I think what was happening was, he was so busy on the external that he was neglecting the internal, which is a tragic mistake. Have you ever been driving along and you look down at your gas gauge 
and lo and behold, it is on empty. You ever had that experience? I've been driving along sometimes, looked down the gas gauge, and it was below empty. And I'm praying, you know, please, and I, and I get to the gas station on fumes. And then there's been a two, three times in my life to where I didn't get to the gas station on fumes. You know, I remember the first time I ever ran out of gas. It was early one morning. It was before daylight. This was years and years, decades ago. And it was raining. It was a Monday morning, raining before dark. And I'm going to work and I'm driving along. And all of a sudden the car went, and I looked down and it was on empty. That's a bad feeling. I think Elijah was running on empty. And he didn't even know that he was running on empty. He was so busy doing good things that he didn't even realize that he was running on empty. Verse 9 of 1 Kings 19. He came thither unto a cave, and some believe actually it was the cave where Moses stood when the glory of God passed by. He came thither unto the cave, and he lodged there. And I don't know how long he was there, but at some point, God came to him. The word of the Lord came to him, and God asked him a question. What doest thou here, Elijah? What did God mean by that question? God's going to ask him that question twice. What did God mean by that question? I don't think God was saying, what are you doing here physically? I think God was saying, what are you doing here spiritually? How did you get to this point? How did, of course, God knew, right? He just, Elijah needed to learn. But how does a man or woman of God who's so excited about serving God and God is using them, how do they get from that point to this point? Of course, God is warning Elijah to try to figure that out even within himself. And Elijah kind of says, verse 10, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts and for the children of Israel. They have forsaken thy covenant. They have thrown down thine altars, and they've slain the prophets with the sword. In other words, God, you don't understand how hard it is. You don't understand how hard my life is. You don't understand how hard my job is, how hard my marriage is, how hard my ministry is. You don't understand how hard it is, God. And he says, not only that, God, I, even I, am only am left. I'm the only one that's doing anything, God. And now they're wanting to kill me. I was thinking about this yesterday. I was thinking about Mary and Martha. You know the story of Mary and Martha, the two sisters? One of the questions, if we get to ask questions in heaven, the question I want to ask is, <laughs> Martha was just trying to fix you all a meal. You understand what I'm saying? You know? I mean, yeah, it's good what Mary was doing, but you know the story, right? You know, Jesus is there and Martha's in the kitchen. And I can't you imagine Martha, you know, sweat on her forehead and flour and she just, and the more she thinks about it, the madder she gets. I'm doing all of this and, and she's looking out there at her sister and she's trying to shake it off and she can't and finally it just spills out and finally she says Lord don't you see what I'm trying to do would you please tell my sister come and help me you know you ever been there I, I'm tempted to ask you to raise your hand how many of you have been there before but better not do it I've been there been there and and then, and here's what puzzles me about the, that story is what Jesus says what you're exactly right Martha now what does Jesus say Martha Martha listen let me tell you something if Jesus ever asks you a question twice or if he calls your name more than once or whatever it is then it means he's trying to dig deep Simon Simon Satan he, he's trying to get your attention Martha Martha you are upset about so many things there's only one thing that's important I was thinking about that yesterday, and I'm, I've always thought, so, okay, so was Martha supposed to say, you know, I don't know what we'll eat, but in a few minutes, Jesus will go, poof, and there it is. Well, maybe that's what Jesus meant. But you know what, I, you know what I've, 
I was thinking about it yesterday. You know what I think Jesus meant? I don't think that Jesus maybe necessarily was saying, somebody doesn't need to fix a meal. I think what Jesus was trying to say was, you're going about it in all the wrong way. You're trying to do it in your own strength, in your own power, as if it all depends on you. And what you should have done, Martha, was just taken some time to come and been with me and build yourself up spiritually. And then you could have served the Lord with gladness. You could have gone back and actually prepared a meal as an act of worship rather than drudgery and duty and complaining. But actually you could have done service to me that would have brought glory to me. I think Martha and, and uh, Elijah and Terry and all of us were pretty much like that. So now God wants to try to help Elijah come out of this. Look at verse 11. God said, go forth and stand on the mountain, the face of the cave before the Lord. And behold, the Lord, this is capital L-R-D, Jehovah, passed by, and a great and a strong wind tore the mountains, hurricane, and it break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that voice, that he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out, and he stood at the entrance of the cave. Somebody asked me at the end of the first service this morning, somebody came to me and somebody said, why did God do the earthquake and the fire and the wind? Why did God do all of those things, but he was not in any of those? I said, well, maybe God was trying to show Elijah that it's not about always the spectacular or something. You know, I think that some people are waiting for God to hear a booming voice out of heaven. Get right with me. And when they hear that booming voice, get right with me, then they're going to get right with God. Whereas I believe God's trying to say every day, you need to come back to me. I believe God's saying that message every day, but I don't think it's going to happen in an earthquake. I think that there's some people that's waiting for somehow, someday there's going to be some great spiritual movement and they're going to be compelled against their own will to come to God. I don't think that. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him is sin. I believe God's speaking to us and wants to speak to us every day if we are able to hear the way God speaks. And I think that God was trying to say to Elijah, Elijah, it's not about calling down fire from heaven. That's good in its place, but Elijah, it's not about that. It's not about the great and mighty miracles. Those things will happen once you have taken care of the inner man. You know, Michelle, would you bring back up that quote again? Can you do that? Look at that quote again. And I know that quote's not inspired per se, but it sure is inspiring. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. What did he mean by that? There's more to do than just, God's not just saying, okay, just say a prayer and step back and poof, it'll happen. No, somebody will have to prepare the meal, Martha. Somebody will have to cook the meal. Somebody will have to prepare the Sunday school lesson or whatever it is. Somebody will have to do those things. You, you can do more than pray after you have prayed. But really, you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. To try to do it without praying is trying to do it in your own strength. And you'll crash. I've crashed. You'll crash. 
I think about a time in my life when I crashed, and some of you have heard me tell the story before. It was about the third year that we was in, I was down in Chattanooga. I was in school preparing for the ministry, and I was wanting to get done with it, and I went to school full time, full time and I worked full time, and, and, I, was, I, was, and I, was, I was running on empty, and I didn't know it. But I'm type A, and so I got it going. I'm still just doing it, you know, churning it out, still working in it. Until suddenly I started just, I, just, I wanted to quit. I, I wanted to die. Isn't that crazy? I thought, I, just can't, I can't do this. I can't keep going. I'd just soon go on to heaven as I would keep trying to do all. Isn't that crazy? That's where I was at. And it wasn't because I wasn't hearing Bible. You know, we had chapel three times a week. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night. We taught in Sunday school. We went Wednesday night, chapel three times a week. My, my major was Bible. It was Bible, 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 Bible. It was all of that. But there's a lot of difference in gaining mental knowledge and something happening, getting into your heart and transforming your heart. And I, I'll make the story short. I, I was at, at the point I was crashing. I wanted to quit, and I didn't know how. I didn't know what to do. Until one morning I heard Charles Stanley. I was riding in midterm exams. I was riding into school. I could take you where I was at in Chattanooga. I was driving to school and Charles Stanley was preaching. And he was preaching about Elijah and people like this. That this is what they're going through. And I'll never forget Charles Stanley said, I can tell you what your problem is. And it was so real I said, please tell me what my problem is. And then he said, you have lost the power of God upon your life. And I thought, you're exactly right. I'm a Bible major, preparing for the ministry, up, Bible up to here. But I do not have the power of God upon my life. And so, the next morning, I got up, and I started having, I was not having devotions. I mean, who has time to study for, to have devotion when you got all this stuff here to do? You know, and you're going to take a Bible class in a minute. Anyhow, why take devotion? Have devotions. But the next morning I got up and I started having devotions and I started doing things not for school, not for ministry, just for me and God. I started doing those things and I started, I got back into my prayer life again and reading God's Word. And, and I'll never forget, I walked into class that morning. And the guy's name was Ted, and he sat directly behind me. And I went in, and I sat down, and I talked to Ted a few minutes. And Ted said, the old Terry's back. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, man, it was written all over your face. You were going to quit. I had not said a word to anybody. He said, I called my dad, and I told my dad, he said, Terry Covey's going to quit. And Terry Covey quits, I quit. I'm like, you're crazy. But he said, but you've changed. He said, the Terry Covey that I first knew, and was actually, isn't that crazy? People are watching you sometimes. You don't even realize it. He said, the Terry Covey that I first knew and it was helping me to get through school, he's back. What happened? And I said, I got the power of God on my life. I got the power of God back on my life. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have the power of God on your life? I know Charles does. Do you? You, individually, do you have the power of God? What happened if you don't? God didn't leave us. You know, I think one of Satan's greatest tools is to get us so busy and deceived that he just kind of just seduces us and pulls us away from God and we don't know it until we're out there in no man's land. And I am confident in my heart that God wants us to get his power back on our lives. I am confident of that. I believe that God wants us to get it on individually so that he can bring it upon us corporately as a church. I do believe that with all my heart. Mm -hmm.